Good afternoon and welcome to this broadcast from Cardiff Metropolitan University. Prynhawn da a chroeso i'r dallediad hwn gan Brifysgol Metropolitan Cardiff. It's midday and time for the sixth episode of our summer professional webinar series produced by the Cardiff Partnership for Initial Teacher Education. This webinar was originally broadcast in May this year. Your presenters today are Dr Judith Neen and Dr Kerry Pugh from Cardiff Metropolitan University. On the discussion panel are Jamie Keir from George Street Primary School and Abby Cooper from Caldecott School, with Lydia Bundy and Ellis Seddon, student teachers from our PGCE primary and secondary programmes. Today's webinar is introduced by the programme leader for PGCE Secondary English, Dr Judith Neen. Hello everybody, a very warm welcome to this session. Um, it will focus on student teacher research uh, in school and in particular how research champions in our Cardiff partnership are supporting that research. So I hope it will provide a helpful picture of how effective and meaningful research um, can be when uh, student teachers are supported in their efforts uh, by a school colleague who is dedicated to uh, a research and inquiry ethos in school. And I also hope it will be a celebration of the huge efforts that our PGC students have put into um, their research this year and a celebration of the research champion support as well. The webinar will include an introduction to the role of research champions um, and also a panel discussion with some research champions and with some student teachers too. Um, we will also hear uh, about a new initiative to support the dissemination of student teacher research led by Tom Brees. Uh, that's of Emeron and Tom Talk Teaching fame, their podcast. If you haven't heard it, then you should uh, research it, find it. Um, we will also welcome your questions and any comments that you might have uh, throughout the session, but particularly during the panel discussion. We'd really like to invite you to uh, use the Q&A facility for that. So let's start with an introduction to research champions. And to do this, I'm going to hand you over to Dr Kerry Pugh who, with some other tutors at Cardiff Net, has been engaged in leading some research on the role of the research champion. Kerry, thank you. Thank you very much, Judith. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak this afternoon. Pranam da, uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I'm going to start off with just giving a little bit of background on where the role of the research champion came from, because some of you may be a little bit less familiar with the term and perhaps uh, the, the role and the, uh, the responsibilities of it. So I'm going to take you back a few years now and give some background. First of all, you, you'll be no doubt aware that since September 2019 within Wales, we've had uh, a, a big review of uh, initial teacher education and new courses have come in, into being for uh, te teacher training. And what that came from was a, a requirement by the Welsh Government going back to 2018 and, and before that, that uh, those PGC programmes, those initial teacher education programmes uh, that were to, to go forward within Wales had to have two main requirements in them. And we can see those there. Uh, first of all, that uh, those new programmes should uh, have schools and university learning being connected to each other much more strongly than they had been previously. And crucially also that re research should play a central role within the programmes moving forward within initial uh, initial teacher education. So setting out to, to actually design new new programs, we, we had a, a blank canvas in, in many ways. We'd had many years of, uh, of strong heritage in initial teacher education, but having that research stipulation at the, at the forefront of, uh, of the new courses going forward set us thinking about which, which way and which direction that the courses should go. Now, you, you'll be aware, no doubt, if you're, you're involved with Cardiff Partnership uh, at all, that we don't talk about 
um, a, a school practice or school placement anymore. We talk about clinical practice, and that actually comes from uh, a research model that uh, that we we have taken from uh, University of Oxford, who are our partners uh, move, moving in, into these new new courses. Uh, Burn and Mutton 20, 2013 put forward uh, a, a research model that actually was derived from the medical profession, the clinical practice model that put at the forefront of the activity of, of the teacher and need to actively engage in inquiry, particularly relating to uh, pupil learner needs, pedagogical choices and evaluation of outcomes for the, the student teacher. Now, crucial to that role, that clinical practice uh, model, was the role of the research champion who was going to uh, form, form a, a, a linchpin of, of that model moving forward. So un unlike those uh, familiar roles that, uh, that we'd had previously of the mentor and senior mentor, the research champion didn't take over from them in, in any way, but they came in and they added to uh, the, their, their function. So a little bit more about the uh, the role of the the research champion. Then uh, it's it's important that we've got that interplay uh, between the relevant research uh, sources and experienced practitioners, and the research champion plays that role of being able to support the activity, exemplifying the shift away from in those old courses a very much a university dominated approach. What are the responsibilities then of the research champion? What, uh, what, what do they actually engage with in terms of uh, development of our student teachers? Well, first of all, they need to be a point of contact between the lead school, Cardiff Partnership, for things related to, to research. They should act as a positive role model for student teachers and colleagues, uh, supporting the benefits of research engagement. Uh, meeting with other research champions in a twilight session once per term within the, the partnership. Crucially, setting briefs for PGC programmes for school-wide research assignments. Very important part. I'll say a little bit more about that later. Then, uh, in relation to PGC programmes, disseminating that research that has taken place by student teachers within schools to, to other relevant parties. Meeting regularly with student teachers, updating the partnership on the school's research focus or foci for the year and then uh, engaging with senior management to consider other collaborations uh, re relating to universities and, and other lead schools. So when when these new courses came into being in, in 2019 we thought it'd be a really good idea to get a research group together to uh, just to to see what the initial perceptions of research champions were uh, as, as to the role that they would be, be taking forward. So I, I was part of a group there and we published our, our findings in the Welsh Journal of Education last year. And there's some, some really interesting findings. I'll share a, a brief summary of, uh, of those with you now. First of all, we saw that research champions recognised that there had been a gap between uh, research uh, within education and classroom practice and that alignment of uh, university based assignment work with the priorities for individual schools would certainly support bridging the gap, making the, the relevance clear to, uh, to individual schools. There was a strong agreement that engagement in research is essential for improvement and that the research champions should provide a positive role model by engaging in research themselves. Finally there that our research champions should have a desire to learn from student teachers and persuade more experienced colleagues within schools of the value of research informed practice as a career uh, a long uh, activity that they should be engaged in. A few other findings that, that that came out of that research. Uh, one of those was uh, an, an interest in developing a sense of community around the research that that was taking place as schools were were getting our student teachers to engage in uh, research that was relevant to them. They felt that a sense of community could could come out of this. Next, that uh, student, student teachers uh, have a, a greater identity within schools as they take on the research uh, focus of, of the school and their contributions are therefore then beneficial to, to the school and, and to all of the staff rather than just being something that they, they complete to get an assignment out of the way. 
Lastly, their further development of community expression around the research focus or foci uh, for that particular year, which leads us on really to the panel discussion of today, the impact of student research within our partnership schools. So I just want to finish there with saying that, you know, that that research that we undertook at the uh, the, the time that the courses were, were put in, into being isn't uh, isn't something that's done and dusted. We are engaging further and we ourselves continue to be engaged in research. I've just started uh, to work now with a, another research group that's looking forward uh, relating to the work of the research champion, but taking it a little bit more widely, taking it across the UK and finding out what the responsibilities uh, of those in a position to influence school based research uh, may be within those areas, perhaps where they don't have a research champion, where, where they haven't come across the role or what 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 is what is actually happening in terms of engagement with research in those schools. So I'm really looking forward to, to getting involved in there and seeing how that research and the data that we get from that can further uh, in, impact our work with with our research champions within Cardiff partnership. So that's all that I wanted to, to say re relating to, to that. I'm sure we're going to have a fantastic discussion as we, we move further on, uh, but I, I'll finish there and I'm now going to hand over to my colleague uh, Tom Breeze and he's going to share with you some details of a new venture that aims to support dissemination of good quality research accessibly to school colleagues. So Dielkenbauer, thank you very much. I'm Tom Breeze. I co-present the podcast Emma and Tom Talk Teaching. It used to be called Emma and Tom's PGC podcast. I originally conceived um, really just with our students in mind. We just wanted to get more kind of ideas and voices into their ears uh, because we didn't see enough of them around uni. But as time went on, we kind of realised that it was getting listened to out in the kind of serving teacher world um, internationally as well. Um, which was interesting. Um, it comes out once a fortnight because I think Emma and I would probably expire if we produced any more <laughs> frequently than that. One of the things I've always felt about being here at the university is that we're in kind of quite a privileged place, I suppose. There's a lot of interesting ideas, a lot of knowledge floating around, a lot of good work being done, um, which is potentially really useful to our partners out in school, particularly as they're trying to kind of navigate their way around the new curriculum um, and the ideas behind that and I've always felt you know a bit old-fashioned sounding I suppose when I put it like this I've always felt we've got a bit of a public service kind of obligation to try and get that stuff out there and get it out there in a way that's that's accessible and can be consumed because you know we can all write journal articles all day long but they you know they take a year before they come out in print and schools haven't got access to a lot of them they cost loads of money so it's not the best really um, so we had this idea that, that we ought to use a medium like the podcast because it's really cheap to produce, it's very cheap to distribute, it's very easy to pass around um, and it can be listened to in that kind of dead time, that, you know, dishwashing, dog walking, you know, driving to work sort of time. Um, and so in, in that respect, the medium is, is really kind of an ideal one for delivering information to teachers. So we've already got the podcast and, and we've got these in between Fridays, uh, the ones when, when an episode doesn't come out. And we had this idea that perhaps the best assignments that the PGCs have done, because the PGCs are now doing assignments that are linked to school development plan priorities we could disseminate those assignments in audio form. So they come into us as a 4,000 word piece of writing and an infographic. And so we simply just ring the student up or, or connect to them down the line um, at the moment because of COVID. Um, and we just ask them to summarize their assignment. And the best students, the ones who've produced the highest marked assignments are very, very good at summarising these pieces of work. I mean, they, they could very easily walk into a conference and present, you know, even at this stage, they could absolutely do that. They're, they're really fantastic. And um, you just ask them a couple of questions and off they go, you know, for 20 minutes at a time sometimes. So uh, that is how uh, PGCE Research Bytes was born. PGCE Research Bytes, from the team behind Emma and Tom Talk Teaching. 
Hello and welcome to PGCE Research Bites, a showcase for the very best student teacher research from the Cardiff Partnership for Initial Teacher Education. My guest for this episode is Matthew Green, who's one of my very own PGCE secondary music students. Hi, Matthew. Hello, Tom. So you've just completed a research project, a literature based research project for your lead partnership school. It's much easier I guess to produce than the main podcast episodes there's you know the guest booking is easy you just email a student you just connect to them down the line and they will just in the best possible sense they just talk at you for 20 minutes 30 minutes 89% of teachers teach or have taught students with ADHD and yet 63% of teachers feel that their training and of understanding ADHD and supporting ADHD students is, is subpar, it's inadequate. Um, so that was quite an alarming statistic. So I started from there before I took a deep dive into more um, specific literature on ADHD and, and blended learning specifically. I really hope that they're useful to schools. I mean, I, I do strongly think that the, the standard of the work is extremely high. Um, and I also strongly believe it's really important that, that we, we become a bit more innovative and a bit more proactive in disseminating this stuff um, out to our school colleagues because it's really good stuff um, and, and we really should be doing this. Um, so I hope it's useful. The, the six articles I will put in the show notes for this episode in case anyone wants to have a read. Um, but thank you very much and, and good luck with all of those things that you're taking forward. Thank you so much. That's really kind. What a fabulous resource uh, and a free resource as well. Um, sharing some really useful research from new teachers. Um, so Google Emma and Tom and Research Bytes and you will find it uh, well worth looking for. Um, thank you for that, Tom. Um, now uh, I'm going to move on to um, the um, role of the research champion now and, and um, the um, the panel that we've put together. So we have a panel of student teachers and research champions who can tell us um, about what it's like in practice. So we've heard about it from Kerry. Before I, I introduce them though, can I just remind you um, about the Q&A facility? If we have any other research champions out there, um, please feel free to add in comments as well or student teachers questions etc feel free to remain anonymous if you want but it would be helpful to know what your role is so you know if you're a teacher uh, or a student teacher um, so i am delighted now to introduce our panel um, of student teachers and research champions i'll start with the student teachers and with um, ellis seddon who was the voice that we heard at the end of Tom's video there. Ellis, can you say hello and um, introduce yourself and what you're, where you are at the moment, please? Hi there, thanks Judith. Yeah, my name is Ellis. I am a secondary religious education student um, currently at Stanwell School in Pinar. That's lovely. Thank you, Ellis. And if I can move on to, we have another uh, student teacher with us, Lydia Bundy. Can you introduce yourself, Lydia? Hello, my name's Lydia and I'm a primary PGC student, currently on my second placement at Tongwin Lice Primary School. Excellent. That's lovely. We have two research champions with us today. Um, Jamie Keir, um, can you introduce yourself, please? Yep, thanks Judith. Um, my name is Jamie Keir. I'm a year one teacher in George Street Primary in Pontypool. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, and we also have Abby Cooper. Abby. Hi everyone, I'm Abby. I'm an um, English teacher in Caldecott School in Monmouthshire. That's lovely. Thank you very much. So now you know our panel. Um, I, I don't think they know each other. We're in these rather strange circumstances of uh, of being digital at, at the moment, uh, but they've all been through this experience of supporting student teacher research or doing student teacher research. So I'm going to go straight to our research champions and I'm going to go to Jamie first of all uh, and ask you Jamie how you came to be 
uh, a research champion. How did you fall into it? Um, I, I think it all started a few years ago. I partook in a, a lesson study week um, as a group of cluster year two teachers when I was in year two. And I got to spend a week in another school and me and three other teachers um, basically followed a lesson study model of looking at um, cross curricular maths, basically. And it was such a wonderful experience, really positive, creating these inquiries and working with colleagues to come up with a piece of research, which has had a real impact on sort of my own pedagogy and how we approach things in our school, but also our neighbouring schools. And I think when the research champion role came up because of it was known my enthusiasm for research, I see it felt like a natural fit. And um, so that's sort of how I fell into being a research champion. But it's gone on as well that I'm now lead inquirer for the National Professional Inquiry Project as well. So it's uh, yeah, definitely been on a good journey of uh, research and inquiry at the minute. <laughs> I'm just wondering what um, you uh, what theme you chose for your students this year, Jamie. Well, we went for and um, maybe it's a common one, but a bit of blended learning. That was the theme we really went for. Um, we were really interested in, you know, it's become sort of flavour of the month, hasn't it? Blended learning this year for obvious reasons. And um, but we were really interested in sort of you know, the term has been around for a while and it's we talking to the students, we wanted to really examine sort of what did it mean? What does it mean now? And maybe what it means for the future as well. So that's sort of been a priority for us. And it's been, yeah, that was why we wanted to look at blended learning, really. Brilliant. I know you're quite right. A lot of schools did choose to look at it quite rightly. Um, and I think that there were a lot of benefits for other students in, in research in that as well. Thank you. Um, if I could turn to Abby, you were new in the role this year as research champion. So I'm interested in uh, how you came to be a research champion and also whether there was anything that helped you settle into the role, Abby. Um, so yeah, so uh, not only was I new to the role of research champion at Caldecott School, but I was actually new to Caldecott School this year as well. So it's been um, all change in my teaching career, definitely. Um, but no, um, when I um, joined Caldecott School in September as an English teacher, I also became a learning and teaching coach. Um, so it goes hand in hand really nicely with the role of research champion. So when I was approached to do this, because of my background of working with um, PGC students, both in Wales, but also in England as well, it just all fitted quite nicely with the experience that I've had in the past. Uh, so I was delighted to take the role on because of um, my interest as well, which was brilliant. Um, when I first took on the role, I obviously had lots of questions. Um, I didn't quite know how the role worked and um, and I joined the sessions that you ran, Judith, um, which were very, very useful. And I had all the material there to go back and have a look at it as well. But um, uh, on contacting Judith, you also arranged for me to have like a, a mentor in another school as well, somebody who had been a research champion before. And we had some correspondence, mostly at the beginning of the process, just where I could just double check how um, they did certain things in uh, with their schools, especially with the current climate as well, with everything being done um, virtually rather than face to face. And um, and that really helped me um, at the beginning with the confidence before I got up and running with it all. So it was really, really helpful. And, and that's really good to hear um, because it is difficult settling into the role. One thing I have discovered about uh, working with the research champions over the last uh, couple of years is, is a, a real spirit of of generosity and sharing as well as a real sense of interest in in the research. So it's good that you were able to call on on other research champions to support like that. Thank you. Abby, what uh, what theme did you choose, by the way, at Caldicott? Um, so the themes that we chose, we actually gave a choice, um, a choice. So we have um, five um, principles of excellence that we um, work to, all teachers work to in their lesson planning and lesson delivery. And so I gave a choice of three of those principles to um, the trainees um, and they could choose then which one they felt suited uh, best with their um, with their subject areas, for example. Um, so the three um, uh, options that I gave them was high level of challenge in lessons, um, quality questioning and feedback for improvement. Um, we actually have two other principles of excellence and to be honest in hindsight knowing that another lockdown was around the corner perhaps we would uh, I might have tweaked this a little bit um, uh, and one of our other um, uh, 
uh, principles is to do with um, visible progress in lessons and I think that's something that's really um, come up in the last lockdown about progress in virtual lessons um, and how we can engage progress in virtual lessons so I think in hindsight in hindsight now it would have been fantastic if some of them would have been able to look at that but you know hindsight's a wonderful thing. <laughs> It is indeed, isn't it? But, uh, but I mean, it, it, it should, um, you know, I'm sure it will all have been really valuable. The interesting thing about the themes that you're talking about is that they emanate from school needs uh, and how school, how your school operates and that. So uh, that's really interesting to hear. And, and it also uh, helps to make the research more worthwhile, I think, that, that the students are doing. Um, let's go to our student teachers then. And Lydia, I'm wondering if you can tell us about the theme that you worked on this year. What theme were you asked to work on and, and how did you start to explore it? Well, I was uh, given the theme of well-being, which obviously is very current and sadly during the times that we were going through as this was also back in October, November around the delivery. So for me, I was exploring it and connecting it to some previous lectures we'd had that been delivered. And for me, I discovered Reading for Pleasure, which was delivered by one of the one of the key lecturers in our primary cohort, uh, Joe Bowers, who is a big passionate and leader for, regarding that concept. So I thought about uh, uniting the two and I did the role of Reading for Pleasure to support people wellbeing, particularly in lockdown and how maybe they're not in the school, but how even at home the role of reading and not as such for academic attainment although that's a direct benefit but reading for enjoyment and how that can support children's well-being so following that I did go back onto the, the lecture that was provided by Joe and looking at the definition some of the resources and actually the key organizations so a big driver is also the Open University and they created their reading for pleasure pedagogy and that's when I discovered that within reading for pleasure there was four key areas and um, so that was such a social reading environs, reading loud, independent reading and inside book talk. And through that, I just uh, explored the literature and uh, got a bit better understanding about how reading for pleasure could link to well-being. That's brilliant. And as a, an English teacher, I am delighted to hear about the focus on, on reading for pleasure. You can't go wrong with that. Um, and I believe that uh, you you have been also involved with Research Bites with Tom yes. uh, and that has actually come out today, <laughs> Tom tells me. So I am really looking forward to listening to that one. Um, thank you for that. How did uh, Lydia, I'm just wondering how the research champion in your school was able to facilitate that? Well, I think it was really excellent, the research champion, because although sadly we couldn't be in person, we did it via Teams and we initially met in November 2020 just to discuss the wider concept of our theme, not so much going into depth, but just understanding well-being and the directions we could take it. And if you did have some ideas, like I was very quick and I knew I had a passion for the reading for pleasure and I put that forward straight away and they're very supportive and said, yes, of course, run with it and go with it. And then as that developed, it's like as if the research champion is on the journey with you remotely, obviously, through teams. But then by the December, uh, we were able to share some key findings and share some of the ideas we had. And I do remember, obviously, with it being December, there was a lot going on with education and the wider world. But my research champion maintained such a clear link and was ensuring that I was OK and my research was flown in the direction I hoped. And they were actually identifying areas, maybe literacy frameworks or even resources they've explored themselves within Reading for Pleasure that could connect to wellbeing. So we, they were a very strong support network doing a very very uh, hard time. Yeah, I mean, it's, it is. You, it's an intense year that yeah. you go through as a student teacher. So getting that support on the research side um, sounds as though it's really what is needed. That's really good to hear. Um, Ellis, uh, I'm wondering what theme you were working to and if you can tell us a little bit uh, about how you went about it. Yes, so my theme given from the research champion at Stanwell was um, a mixture of three themes really. So, so we were given blended learning, uh, vulnerable learners or a mixture of the both. Um, so from um, previous work that I had done, we um, in previous work that I had done, I'd done a lot of work in inclusivity and ADHD had popped up every so often in that sort of area, but I, I have to be honest, I didn't know much about it. Um, and so 
knowing the statistics that Tom Tom showed in the little clip earlier about um, teachers um, confidence around managing students with the ADHD, I decided to latch hold on to that one and to explore it a little bit further, knowing that it's something I'm inevitably going to con come into contact with in my teaching career. And then obviously, given everything that was going on at the time with blended learning, working from home, I decided it would be a really interesting mix to marry the two together. Um, I started, um, well, pretty much all of the research that I did was mainly based mainly based online um, through various journal articles, uh, charity websites, various different resources. And I started with mixing together um, search results such as online learning, hybrid learning, with things like ADHD, additional learning needs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, came very quickly to the appreciation that there is actually no literature out there that combined the two together. Um, and so I came at it from a different approach and I started to look specifically for literature on blended learning and supporting learner engagement within that, particularly not worrying about the additional learning need element. And then I picked up other resources which spoke specifically about ADHD or additional learning needs. And it was from getting those two resources or those two different themes, I then did my very best to sort of marry them together and see how they actually may be able to mix in this, this new environment that we found ourselves in at the time. Mm -hmm. And um, what were the key things that you shared with the school? um at the end of your lit your research ellis so there were some really interesting um recommendations that came out um the at the very base level the very fundamental level for students with adhd is knowing what their personal motivations are and that's not necessarily just in the classroom base that's what are their interests what do they like doing what really gets them going on a day-to-day -day basis but also understanding um, the indicators of their engagement. So when do we actually know these students are engaged and they are on task? Because unless we know that, we're not going to be able to put in the appropriate facilitative techniques for engagement. So that's at the very base level. Um, then to support students specifically with that, we can have things like if then plans. So something, um, a main finding with students with ADHD is that their self-regulatory um, capacity is diminished. So if we put in a sentence such as, if X happens, if I am distracted, then I will do Y. Having that with the students helps them to recognise the undesirable situation, whatever it is that is happening, and therefore it gives them an impetus to change their behaviour. So that was really, really interesting. And then I would marry that with having personal best goals as well for um, those students. Really interestingly, some of the research that there is, is that having personal best goals, things that they want to achieve and, and to keep going, actually there's a study which says it benefits students with ADHD more than it does students with without ADHD. And so there's a really interesting concept there where we might be able to narrow the attainment gap because it's not about capability, it's just about these self-regulatory capacities. So if we can improve that, we have the opportunity there to, to really bolster um, students with ADHD and their confidence. Um, and then the only other one I will talk about for now, which I think is, is really interesting, is actually accept that distraction happens. Don't try and ignore that. Don't try and think that it doesn't and don't try and think that you'll ever be able to come up, up to it. It does. And especially in a blended learning environment, what we are using, the laptop, is inevitably a tool for distraction for students. Um, their phone might go, the dog might bark, the, the house bell might ring. Except that that is going to happen. But put in... Um, things which can help the students get back on track. And that came from Douglas Mobb's um, Teach Like a Champion team. Um, so put the instructions clearly on the screen, make sure they know what to do, perhaps use the if then plans of if I get distracted, then I will do X, Y, Z. And overall, the really interesting finding was that everything that's gonna be able to support ADHD students is also gonna be able to support non-ADHD students. It's very generalizable. It's very low cost um, and, and hopefully um, could go a long way to supporting the learner engagement. Yeah, thank you, Ellis, for sharing that. Some um, 
really practical and powerful messages coming through there about about your research. Um, and and I get a strong sense from both Lydia and and Ellis talking about your research that you've really taken ownership of of those thematic areas that you were asked to research into. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to come back to the research champions now and ask um, some more pragmatic questions really um, about now, Jamie, how many students were you actually working with at one time and and how did you manage that process? Um, so initially we started with seven, but ultimately ended up with six. Um, what we did initially was set up a team and have, as I think Lydia said earlier, just have a general chat about the theme really and just you know explore what initial ideas might be, what initial um, preconceptions, um, talk about why it's important to our school that we want to have a look at this, why it's on our school development plan. And just sort of, you know, just get the initial foundation of where they might like to go with an inquiry. Um, so we organised that, if I remember, remember, memory serves, maybe start November, end of October, around about that time. So that was really good to start and off they went. And then we met up via teams periodically, a couple of times I think before Christmas and then one afterwards, just sort of checking in, uh, presenting texts that they were really interested in sort of maybe wrestling with the, with questions a little bit. I was really interested when you said about there wasn't any, um, there wasn't much literature out there. And there's a lot of that coming back about there's not much about blended learning or blended learning in a foundation phase or something like that. So I really tried to um, get across that part of the research journey is perhaps, you know, finding a bit about blended learning or flip learning or distance learning and then finding out about maybe independence in a foundation phase or somebody brought a really good text and they said oh but it's in New Zealand and it's like well you know if it's of value go for it get it in there so yeah it became like a real sort of collaborative thing and because our own inquiry uh, as lead inquiry on the project my own inquiry is on a very similar theme as well so actually I got a lot of really useful information from them and the trainee teachers were informing me as much and I felt like you know I was one of those and felt like we were on a journey together we were in it together which is really lovely um so yeah teams is a great tool for us and that's something that's come from blended learning as well having files and setting up that group where we could put things in that was a real big help and I think it, that was a, a strong part of being able to support the students who you know we haven't been able to meet yet and or get to meet yeah Jamie you you talk about your own research interests there as well so how does being a research champion uh, tie in with your own research interests? So um, I think I passionately believe that research does inform your teaching so when we're setting I'm a class mentor as well little things like setting research and inquiry tasks I notice it's slightly different you know uh, the example I set of like, well, what you found out, how does it impact you? What are the ways forward is an example that I really try and set. And I think. I've really tried to get across to the students that, you know, this assignment and the role of the research they are doing has real benefits to them and to school and to your development as a teacher, because I do it in my job. And I've, that, that's why I've really tried to get across. You know, it's not something that's done in isolation. I remember when I did my PGC, maybe, you know, you had university happening there, school happening there, and it didn't, you know, there were sort of slightly different entities, but I've, in my role, research is a big part of my role in school, and I've really tried to sort of get that across and show that this can have a massive impact on you as a teacher. Yeah, that, that's, that's really good to hear. Um, if I can come back to uh, Abby, um, again, Abby, you were working in a secondary school. Um, how many students were you working with? Um, so we had 15 students that I was working with yeah. um, and it was a very similar uh, pattern of uh, meetings that we had from um, I'm going to say end of October, maybe it was beginning of November through to just after Christmas. Um, it would have been lovely to be able to um, have those meetings face to face. 
Um, I think in some ways, although Teams is a wonderful tool, I think I need um, some more lessons in Teams, um, as we all do, <laughs> probably. Um, but no, although Teams is a wonderful tool, it would have been lovely for us to be able to get in the class in a classroom together and actually share physically share the research that we've that we've found. And um, but we had some fantastic discussions and um, it was a real um, you've talked about collaboration already, but it was a real team effort. So hearing because we had the choice of the three um, different um, foci for the actual research. Uh, it meant that everyone could help each other out with different pieces of research that they found and we had some fantastic discussions about it. Um, so it really was a team effort um, between everybody. Brilliant. Uh, and it's, it's, that's one of the, the noticeable things that, that has changed about this assignment because, um, you know, previously the students uh, did an assignment uh, without uh, particular help from school and actually it's made it into a much more collaborative thing and and obviously if you're doing research um, and you are not sharing that research then it's dead research isn't it and 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 that's so um, this this process of collaboration is really important. Uh, thank you for that, Abby. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, Abby, if you can explain a little bit about um, a little bit more about how the students shared that research with the school. Yes, of course. So what we did, because we had 15 students, that was um, it was quite a lot uh, and it would have taken quite a long time to actually go through 15 students all at once. So we split um, the sessions up over a, a number of weeks um, and invited um, a number of the um, student teachers to come and present to myself and to uh, members of our SLT in school as well. Um, and so they just talked through their um, uh, visual summary or their infographic and uh, they just talked through uh, and presented it via Teams once again um, before we then um, had almost like a question and answer session afterwards where we could ask about the research and ask questions um, depending on what they presented to us. Um, so that was done over a series of uh, I'm going to say four or five sessions. I can't remember exactly how many, but it was four or five sessions and it worked really, really well. Once again, it would have been fab to do it in person and um, so we could have seen the visual summaries and had a face to face conversation, but it did work really, really well with them presenting, um, uh, presenting to myself and to members of SLT as well. Brilliant. Thanks for that. Um, I, I probably should have said a little bit about the assignment that it, it is designed uh, with an infographic or a visually uh, a visual element to help support that feedback to the school. Um, but that, that's really helpful. Jamie, was it the same sort of process with your school? It was indeed, yes. We had the, the student teachers were presenting via Teams to me and our deputy head, but we also invited their mentors in as well because um, they played a big part in sort of shaping ideas and research. And when you said about collaboration earlier, it was it was quite a proud moment hearing that you're my own student talking so passionately and so eloquently and knowledgeably about the subject. And it was really it was it was a really lovely day, really enjoyable. And it was clear that the students had put in so much work and put in such so much of themselves into it that it made for really fascinating um, presentations. I also think um, it's it, that, that whole infographic sort of concept was a really fantastic way of presenting that information and um, yeah it's just I thought it was a really a really fantastic day and it was it gave sort of the assignment a real good bit of focus and it's actually a really good way of getting to know the, the students that were coming to us in um, clinical practice too like um, the, the two that we've got in foundation phase near my classroom I feel like I've known them for, for a year because I've worked so closely and it's it felt like they just slotted in as members of the team really well and that, that was a really good good feature this year that we were able to work with them before they came to us which wasn't quite the same last year. Yeah thank you for that I mean one of the things the feed the bits of feedback that I've had time and time again this year um, is how impressed uh, research champions have been with the student research so so coming back to the students obviously you've impressed uh, colleagues in school um, but I'm wondering how useful the research has been to you individually. Um, perhaps I can ask uh, Lydia first. Yeah, so for me, I think really stemming and sourcing from what Jamie said earlier, as I develop as a teacher throughout the PGC and look forward to hopefully at an NQT year, 
the, 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 the fact of research is really core to my developing practice. And I think as we explore the new curriculum now as, as fresh teachers, it really highlights that education isn't static and it's just constantly evolving. And through research, we evolve with it. So for me, um, exploring reading for pleasure is something that's opened my eyes to a world of reading, both as a teacher and as personal aspects of what reading can do for all our well-being. In the classroom space, you can create these reading areas and these corners for children that sometimes when they have an overwhelming day or a tough day, they know that's a safe place and they can go there and they can flick through the books looking at the pictures. So for me, it's informed my practice that as I go forward as a teacher, how I design my classroom space, how I'll give children opportunities to look at the literature, as well as improving their literacy skills. It's allowing them to look at these characters and look at how they may have encountered encounter different scenarios and they connect to that. And ever more so, I was linking it a lot to maybe the isolation from COVID and away from school and these feelings at very young age they might have missed their friends they missed their families and they felt quite lonely but through the literature we can explore these stories and children can understand it's okay and it will get better so for me as I look forward I can only dream of one day making a, a future classroom full of lots of amazing books and exploring them and and really exploring research further and that's why when Jamie just said that it really resonated it made me think Hopefully, you know, as I finish my PGCE and I get successful and find a job, I think research will always be a real centre point and maybe it'll stem on from reading for pleasure and wellbeing and it'll go to other areas. And it just shows that we are changing with education. It's always making your practice and the learning environment and the, and the learners experiences as best as we possibly can. I think research is the answer for that. Well, thank you, Lydia. I am so excited for you going forward as a teacher <laughs> in the classroom. That's brilliant. Ellis, same question for you. What, what's it done for you, this research? I think um, from the recommendations that I've come up with, I have been able to put some of those practical um, suggestions in place. Um, rather ironically, just despite the statistics, I haven't yet had any ADHD students in any of the classes that I've taught, but the, the uh, getting to know the students, the motivations behind them, the the um, plans like that is, is all still been really, really valuable. The back on track activities, I've managed to to um, understand that one student's hobby is trains. So bring trains into a philosophy concept and that sort of thing. It's just very, very simple stuff. Um, but I think I, I am looking forward into NQT here to, to implementing some of my recommendations a little bit more and exploring them further. But I think as, as Lydia said as well, for me, it's just given me that perspective which I think I may have neglected a little bit going into a um, teaching profession that actually it is teaching isn't just a case of picking up a lesson or planning a lesson and delivering it it's that active element to the teaching side where you're constantly reviewing constantly co contributing as the teaching professional um, to that environment and trying to evolve it so I think at, at a, just a very simple level it's really hammered in that that perspective and that understanding that it's something I need to and will enjoy uh, keeping up with it and taking through my career. Lovely, thank you, Ellis. And and any any tips for students who are doing this sort of research in future, Ellis? I think very cliche. Start the reading early. <laughs> Everyone tells you to do it, but absolutely start the reading early. But I think another um, thing for me as well is try your very best not to go in with a preconceived idea about what your research topic is going to look like. I think I probably um, gave myself a lot of unneeded stress and anxiety thinking that it's not going the way I planned. It's not. Why isn't this working? Why isn't it gelling? And actually talking to the research champion, it was simply because having done the reading, my project had progressed in a, in a different way to what I expected. And that's absolutely OK. So try and do a broad level of research first, then go into your project rather than going in with a preconceived idea is what I would say. Lovely. That's <laughs> very good advice, Alice. Thank you. Um, and, uh, and any tip, what would be your main tip, Lydia? I think mine would be uh, don't panic. I can often, when you're given a theme like wellbeing, you can think, oh my God, you know, it's so broad and where could I go and where could I take it? And I think you need to take that time 
to sit down and think what's important for you. And often, if you think about what aspects of education are quite important to you, so for me, it was exploring reading, you can find them connections and you can think, well, yeah, well-being, that can pair with reading. But for example, if someone had a passion for sport, you can you can pair your well-being to those, value, those concepts that are very deep-rooted and important to you as a developing teacher. So it would be just to not, as soon as you get your topic, you can think, oh, I don't, I don't know where to take that. Take the time just to sit back and think and reflect on yourself and think, well, what am I looking to get out of the course in these coming weeks and months? And what am I passionate about? And what would I enjoy researching? For me, spending some of them days or the Sundays reading all about reading for pleasure and expanding my library collection willingly, buying all these wonderful books, it's because it was a passion and I enjoyed it. And the process then, it flows wonderfully. And that's why when it comes to doing research bites with Tom, you can't help but wanting to share as much as you can because it did become your life a bit. And when you went into a classroom space, you automatically did look, where's the reading corner or what books have you got? So make it an enjoyable and a, something that stems from your passion that you'd like to take forward. That's brilliant ad advice. Thank you, Lydia. Um, before before we close, I want a, a last word from our very important research champions here. Um, and I just wonder if you can sum up what the impact of the research has been for your school. Um, Abby, can you sum that up? Um, yes, of course. So um, uh, it's been delayed slightly because of um, COVID and because of centre determined grades periods going on at the moment. But we've got plans for um, uh, firstly, it's going to be departmental um, sessions to do with looking at all the um, research that the 15 trainees um, have put together. Um, so that's going to be departmental time in a couple of weeks. Uh, and then we've got um, time scheduled um, on our learning and teaching inset day after um, the next half term. So in the last summer term where we're actually going to be coming back and sharing as um, as a whole school, all the findings um, that the um, trainees have come across. So um, it's really exciting what this research is going to be used, used for in um, in our school. Brilliant. Thank you for that, Abby. Um, and uh, Jamie, how about the impact of the research for for George Street? Well, I'd say it's probably threefold. We've seen some really interesting um, teaching techniques, uh, pedagogical sort of interventions from the trainee teachers in the classroom. We've seen some really interesting use of uh, techniques that have stemmed from the research when doing distance learning or through technology. But one thing that I hadn't thought about, and I spoke to one of the mentors today when she, I told her that I was coming on this webinar, and she said when she heard her, um, her trainee teacher feeding back on that uh, dissemination day, it made her feel happier about how she was doing blended learning because she said, you know, in this difficult time and it's been a really, there's been a lot of upheaval, it's, there's a real tempting w uh, way to sort of look at yourself and go, this isn't working, you know, why can't it, if they were in school, it'd be working this way. But having really good quality research from her trainee teacher actually made her sort of celebrate all the great things she was doing in class. And it said it gave her a real good sort of push and a, um, a real great sense of like, of well-being really. And that was something I hadn't thought would come from research and that was, quite a nice surprise really to hear that the research had had that impact on a member of our staff. That, that is a, a wonderful note um, for us to finish on Jamie. Thank you for sharing that because obviously the impact on the individual is is what it's all about really. Um, so we are drawing uh, to the close of our webinar so I'd like to to thank all of those uh, people involved in bringing this together. So thank you Kerry Pugh. Um, Tom Brees and, and Rhea Mulligan have been behind the scenes as well, thank you. Uh, but particularly our panel uh, who have made it possible. So Abby Cooper from Caldicott, Jamie Keir from George Street uh, and our student teachers, uh, wonderful teachers of the future, Ellis Seddon and Lydia Bundy, thank you for giving up your time. Um, and thank you also to all the research champions in our partnership who do a wonderful job of supporting teacher, student teacher research, much appreciated. Um, I just want to flag up uh, our next seminar, 
uh, is due to be on Thursday the 10th of June and it will be looking at the principles of professional inquiry. So I think there'll be some really good food for thought there uh, and we hope that you can join us then. But it only remains for me to say thank you once again and goodbye. <laughs>